So this is a verse in the Quran because maybe maybe some people will say this is not true. The Quran never said that women they give themselves to the Prophet, and you will see him. He choose right away to do ba to bang them, and some of them he tell them, "Let us do it later. I will do it later." You know? Okay. So this is Surah 33, verse 51. But I'm not going to talk about this one now. I will go back to show you the disaster we will see in here because the topic is not women giving themselves to Muhammad because this is all the news but we will talk about it in the, in the video about this verse in the Quran but what we will talk about in here is something disgusting let us read first what the hadith is saying <clears throat> this woman her, her name Khawla bintu Hakim she gave herself to the Prophet to bang her she want him to do the F word to her okay so she came to him and she said to him Prophet can you bang me? Can you take me? Take me, take me, take me, baby. You know, and just, just seeing women doing that to that man, it's telling us how filthy and how low class he is. Why? Because uh, if they do not know that's Muhammad, he would love to do that to them. They will never come and ask for it. And even there is a verse in the Quran about that. We will talk about that verse later. So just to mentioning, like just, just thinking about that and knowing that Muhammad he will never say to women, horny women, no, telling us who is Muhammad. I think this is very clear. But what we will see in here is a lot more than this. But before we go and show you the surprise, this woman, she is coming to the Prophet, peace upon him. Please, always guys, we have to say peace upon him. Don't, don't offend Muslims, otherwise they will go in the street and they will say we will kill you, okay? I don't want to offend Muslims because I'm scared of them. So, peace upon him, huh? he did uh, 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 accept that woman to bang her. And who is she? Her name is Khawla. And in here you will see Aisha, she is saying, isn't it like don't those women have a shame? to give their body to a stranger let us go to Google translation and see the translation of Google <coughs> here we go come on Google translate Google are waiting okay this is a translation they gave him Binti Hakim this is the translation. It's not very accurate, but it's okay. So, it was a gift. Bint Hakim, she gave herself to the Prophet to bang her. And the Aisha, the, the, the wife of the Prophet, she is saying, Aisha, she said, either they, aren't they ashamed of those women who they are blowing themselves on a man? Which means Muhammad, she is get, getting jealous, you know. This is a jealousy of women. Long line of women, they are horny. All of them, they are Muslims. And they want Muhammad to bang them. And I wonder what, what the Muslim men, they are doing there. Like they are watching the pimp, opening their women. Like, really, those women, who we are talking about women, coming to a man, saying to him, we want you to sleep with us. Those women, don't they have men? Don't they have family? Don't they have parents? Don't they have fathers? Don't they have husbands? Who is the man who will accept his daughter or his wife or his sister to do such a thing like this? Except if they are a prostitute. Except if all, you know, the only way to explain that, if all the community is the community of prostitution and all the men, they are pimps. Because no man will accept such a thing to happen. No man will accept that his daughter will go to a man and say, hey, do the F word to me. No man will accept that his wife or his, his mother or his daughter, who, whoever she is, she go to any man and say to him, I'm giving you myself. Take me, take me take me baby and she is doing that in the front of the public as you see Aisha she is saying aren't they ashamed now the problem is not here the problem is who is Khawla the woman he, she gave herself to Muhammad is the aunt of the Prophet of Islam oops uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
This is the book of Musnad Ahmad. This is Hadith 260050. The name of the chapter is the Hadith, which means the speech of Khawla bint Hakim. Even the chapter have her name. And just to show you that the connection between this woman and Muhammad is a sexual connection, because she never she never mentioned in the Hadith in anywhere in the Hadith except she is talking about sexual life, sex. Either she is bringing women to Muhammad to bang them, or she is asking him to bang her, or she is asking him the following as the Hadith is saying. What the Hadith is saying? Khawla bint Hakim. She asked the Prophet, and she is one of the ants of the Prophets. Okay, let me show. Let me take it to Google Translation and post it in there. Just. Quran, thirty-three fifty. O Prophet, we have made lawful for you your wives whose bridal dues you have paid, and the slave girls you possess from among the prisoners of war, and the daughters of your paternal uncles and paternal aunts, and the daughters of your maternal uncles and maternal aunts who have migrated with you, and a believing woman who gives herself to the Prophet and whom he wants to take in marriage. O Prophet, this privilege is yours alone to the exclusion of other believers. We know well what restrictions we have imposed upon them as regards their wives and those whom their right hands possess, and have exempted you from those restrictions that there may be no constraint upon you. Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. This, in fact, is an answer to the objection of the people who said that Muhammad peace be upon him forbade others to keep more than four wives at a time but had himself taken a fifth wife. This objection was raised because at the time the Prophet peace be upon him married Zainab, he already had four wives with him. 1. Sada, whom he had married in the third year before the Hijra. 2. Aisha, whom he married in the third year before the Hijra but who came to live with him in Shawal, A.H. 1. 3. Hafsa, whom he married in Shaban, A.H. 3, and 4. Um Salama, whom he married in Shawal, A.H. 4. Thus, Zainab was his fifth wife. May Allah be pleased with them all. Here Allah has answered the objection of the disbelievers and the hypocrites, as if to say, O Prophet, we have made lawful for you all these five wives whom you have married by giving them their dowers. In other words, the answer means this, it is we who have imposed the restriction of four wives on others, and it is also we ourselves who have made our Prophet an exception to the restriction. When we could impose the restriction, we could also make the exception. Also, about this answer one should note that it was not meant to satisfy the disbelievers and the hypocrites but those Muslims to whom the opponents of Islam were trying to impart evil suggestions. Since they believed that the Quran is Allah's speech and has been sent down in Allah's own words, Allah declared through a clear and decisive verse that the Prophet peace be upon him, had not made himself an exception from the general law about four wives of his own accord, but the exception in regard to him had been decreed by Allah. Besides making the fifth wife lawful for the Prophet, Allah in this verse also granted him the permission to marry a few other kinds of the women. One, the woman who came into his possession from among the slave girls granted by Allah. According to this the Prophet peace be upon him, selected for himself Raihana from among the prisoners of war taken at the raid against the Bani Kareza, Juwairia from among the prisoners of war taken at the raid against the Bani al-Mustalik, Sophia out of the prisoners of war captured at Khyber, and Mariah the Copt, who was presented by Makaukis of Egypt. Out of these he set three of them free and married them, but had conjugal relations with Mariah on the ground of her being his slave girl. In her case there is no proof that the Prophet peace be upon him, set her free and married her. Two, the ladies from among his first cousins, who emigrated along with him. The words, who emigrated with you, do not mean that they accompanied the Prophet peace be upon him, in his migration journey but this that they also had migrated in the way of Allah for the sake of Islam. The Holy Prophet was given the choice to marry any one of them he liked. Accordingly, in AH7 he married Umm Habibah. Incidentally, in this verse it has been elucidated that the daughters of one's paternal and maternal uncles and aunts are lawful for a Muslim. In this regard the Islamic law is different both from the Christian law and from the Jewish law. Among the Christians one cannot marry a woman whose line of descent joins one's own anywhere in the last seven generations, and among the Jews it is permissible even to marry one's real niece, i.e. daughter of one's brother or sister. 3. The believing woman who gives herself to the Prophet peace be upon him, i.e. who is prepared to give herself in marriage to the Prophet peace be upon him, without a dower, and he may like to marry her. 
On account of this permission the Prophet peace be upon him, took Hadrat Maimuna as his wife in Shawal, AH7, but he did not think he should have conjugal relations with her without paying her the dower. Therefore, he paid her the dower even though she did not demand or desire it. Some commentators say that the Prophet peace be upon him did not have any wife who had offered herself to him, but this in fact means that he did not keep any wife without paying her the dower although she offered herself to him. If this sentence is taken to be related with the preceding sentence, it will mean that it is not permissible for any Muslim to take in marriage a woman who gives herself to him, without paying her the dower. And if it is taken to be related with the whole preceding passage, it will imply that the concession to marry more than four wives is only reserved for the Prophet peace be upon him, not for the other Muslims. This verse also shows that certain commandments are specifically meant for the Prophet peace be upon him, to follow and are not applicable to the other Muslims. A study of the Quran and Sunnah reveals several such commandments. For example, the Tahajjud prayer was obligatory for the Prophet peace be upon him, but is voluntary for the Ummah. It is unlawful for him and his family to receive charities though it is not so for others. The inheritance left by him cannot be divided, as for the inheritance left by others relevant commandments have been given in Surah and Nisa. Keeping of more than four wives was made lawful for him though he was not enjoined to do equal treatment with them. He was permitted to marry a woman who gave herself to him without any dower, and after his death his wives were forbidden for the Ummah. None of these privileges could be enjoyed by any other Muslim. Another special thing that the commentators have mentioned in this regard is that it was forbidden for the Prophet peace be upon him, to marry a woman from among the people of the book though it is lawful for the Muslims to do so. This is the reason why Allah made the Prophet peace be upon him, an exception to the general rule. That there should be no difficulty, restraint, upon you, does not mean that he was, God forbid, a very lustful person, and therefore, he was permitted to marry several wives so that he might not feel any hindrance due to the restriction to four wives. This meaning will be understood only by the person who, blinded by prejudice, forgets that the Prophet peace be upon him, at the age of 25 married a lady who was 40 years old, and lived a happy, contented married life with her for full 25 years. Then, when she died, he marred another old lady Sada, who remained his only wife for the next four years. Now, no sensible and honest person can imagine that when he became over 53 he was suddenly filled with lust and needed to have more and more wives. In fact, in order to understand the meaning of, no restraint, one should, on the one hand, keep in view the great task whose responsibility Allah had placed on the Prophet peace be upon him, and on the other hand, understand the conditions and circumstances under which he had been appointed to accomplish the great task. Anyone who understands these two things with an unbiased mind, will certainly realize why it was necessary to grant him freedom in respect of the wives and what hindrance was there for him in the restriction to four wives. The task entrusted to the Prophet peace be upon him, was that he should mold and chisel by all-round education and training an uncouth, uncultured nation which was not uncivilized only from the Islamic point of view but from a general viewpoint as well, into a highly civilized, refined and virtuous nation. For this purpose an unbiased mind will certainly realize why it was necessary to grant him freedom in respect of the wives and what hindrance was there for him in the restriction to four wives. For this purpose it was not enough only to train men but the training of the women was also equally necessary. However, the principles of social life and civilization which he had been appointed to teach forbade free mixing of the sexes together, and it was not possible for him to impart direct training to the women folk without violating this rule. Therefore, for imparting education to the women the only alternative left for him was that he should marry several women of different ages and mental capabilities and should prepare them by education and training to become his helpers, and then employ them to give religious instructions to the young, middle-aged and old women of the city and desert and teach them the new principles of morality and civilization. Moreover, the Prophet peace be upon him, had also been appointed to abolish the system of life of the pre-Islamic days of ignorance and replace it with the Islamic system of life practically. For the accomplishment of this task a conflict was inevitable with those who upheld the system of ignorance, and this conflict was being encountered in a country where the tribal system of life was prevalent with all its peculiar customs and traditions. Under these conditions, besides other devices, it was also necessary that the Prophet peace be upon him, should marry in different families and clans in order to cement many ties of friendship and put an end to enmities. Thus, the selection of the ladies whom he married was to some extent determined by this object besides their personal qualities. By taking Aisha and Hafsa as wives he further strengthened and deepened the relations with Abu Bakr and Umar. 
Um Salama was the daughter of the family to which Abu Jal and Khalid bin Walid belonged, and Um Habiba was the daughter of Abu Sufyan. These marriages neutralized the enmity of these families to a large extent. So much so that after Um Habiba's marriage Abu Sufyan never confronted the Prophet peace be upon him, on the battlefield. Safiya, Juwairiya and Raihana belonged to Jewish families. When the Prophet peace be upon him, married them after setting them free, the hostile Jewish activities against him subsided. For according to the Arab traditions when the daughter of a clan or tribe was married to a person, he was regarded as the son-in-law of not only the girl's family but of the entire tribe, and it was disgraceful to fight the son-in-law. Practical reformation of the society and abolition of its customs of ignorance was also included among the duties of his office. Therefore, he had to undertake one marriage for this purpose also, as has been related in detail in this Surah Azab itself. For these reasons it was essential that there should be no restriction for the Prophet in respect of marriage so that in view of the requirements of the great mission entrusted to him he could marry as many women as he wanted. This also brings out the error of the view of those people who think that polygamy is permissible only under special personal requirements and apart from these there can be no other object for which it may be permissible. Evidently, the reason for the Prophet peace be upon him, to marry more wives than one was not that the wife was sick, or barren, or that he had no male child, or that there was the question of the bringing up of some orphans. Without these restrictions, he married all his wives either in view of the educational requirements, or for the reformation of society, or for political and social objectives. The question is, when Allah himself has not kept polygamy restricted to a few particular needs, which are being mentioned these days and the messenger of Allah took several wives for many purposes other than these, how is another person entitled to propose some restrictions in the law and then claim that he is imposing these in accordance with the Sharia? As a matter of fact, the root cause for the imposition of these restrictions is the Western concept that polygamy is an evil in itself. That very concept has given rise to the idea that this unlawful thing can become lawful only in case of extreme circumstances. Now, however hard one may try to label this imported concept with Islam artificially, it is entirely alien to the Quran and Sunnah and the whole Muslim literature. Quran. 424. And also forbidden to you are all married women, Musanit, except those women whom your right hands have come to possess, as a result of war. This is Allah's decree and it is binding upon you. But it is lawful for you to seek out all women except these, offering them your wealth and the protection of wedlock rather than using them for the unfettered satisfaction of lust. And in exchange of what you enjoy by marrying them pay their bridal due as an obligation. But there is no blame on you if you mutually agree to alter the settlement after it has been made. Surely Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. This verse has more relevance to the war situation at that time when as a matter of general practice, after war women who come as captives of war, known as slave girls, leaving their husbands behind in Dar al-Harb, domain of war, I. E. If we talk in today's context from the war place located in enemy's country to the his own country, are not prohibited, for their marriage is nullified by virtue of their entry into Dar al-Islam, domain of Islam. Such captive men women as a matter of war policy are not generally allowed to go back to their country and in such a situation there can be three ways that women can stay as captive. 1. Remain in prison and die there. 2. Become a subject of enjoyment of many soldiers and spend life like a prostitute. In fact this was the situation at that time when any women become captive by a non-Islamic country. 3. Remain with a particular solder in lawful manner same as a wife. First two option are as were prevalent are not good and then Islam has come for a better option, as third one in the interest of captive women. And accordingly, a man may marry such women and, if they happen to be his slave girls, he may have sexual relations with them in the manner as described hereafter. There is disagreement, however, among jurists as to what should be done if both husband and wife have been taken captive together. Abu Hanifa and the jurists of his school are of the opinion that their marriage should remain intact. Malik and Shafi'i, on the other hand, argue that their matrimonial contract should be rendered void. Many misunderstandings seem to persist about the right to have sexual relations with one's slave girls. It is pertinent to call attention to the following regulations of Islam. 1. Islam does not permit soldiers of the Islamic army to have sexual relations with women they capture in war. Islamic law requires that such women should first be handed over to the government, which then has the right to decide what should be done with them. It may either set them free unconditionally, release them on payment of ransom, exchange them for Muslim prisoners of war held by the enemy or distribute them among the soldiers. 
a soldier may have sexual relations only with that woman who has been entrusted to him by the government. 2. Even then, he may not have sexual relations with her until at least one menstrual period has expired, this is in order to establish that she is not already pregnant. If the woman concerned is pregnant one may not have sexual relations with her until after the birth of her child. 3. It is not necessary for female captives of war to be people of the book in order that sexual relations with them be permitted. The man to whom such a woman is entrusted has the right to have sexual relations with her regardless of her religious affiliations. 4. Only that person to whom a female captive has been entrusted has the right to have sexual relations with her. Any child born to her will be regarded as the legitimate child of her master, and will be entitled to all the rights laid down by the law for one's issue. Moreover, once such a woman has given birth to a child she may not be sold to anyone, and on the death of her master she automatically becomes a free person. 5. If the master allows the woman to marry someone else he ceases to have the right to sexual relations with her but retains the right to have her serve him in other ways. 6. Although the law has fixed the maximum number of wives at four, it has set no limit with regard to slave girls. The law does not lay down a limit in order to encourage people to accumulate huge armies of slave girls, and thereby turn their homes into dens of sexual enjoyment. Rather the law does not define the limit because the effects of war and the total number of female captives that would have to be disposed of after a certain war are unpredictable. 7. In the same way as other rights of property are transferable, so are the proprietary rights regarding the captives of war that have been legally entrusted to a man by the state. 8. Since the regular conferment of property rights is as legal an act as that of marriage, there is no basis for a person who feels no revulsion towards the idea of marriage to feel revulsion towards the idea of having sexual relations with a slave girl duly entrusted to him. 9. If a government confers proprietary rights to a man over a female captive of war it forfeits the right to withdraw those rights in the same way as the guardian Wally, of a woman ceases to have the right to withdraw his agreement to the marriage proposal after the marriage has been contracted. 10. If a military commander permitted his soldiers to temporarily use the female captives as objects of sexual desire and distributed them among the soldiers for that purpose, such an act would be considered unlawful by Islamic law. Such an act is not essentially different from fornication or adultery. What is best about SanDisk Extreme Pro Portable SSD? The SanDisk Extreme Pro Portable SSD is loaded with powerful features and is a go-to product for all your vacations, trips, adventures and even to store all your office projects. The new SanDisk Extreme Pro Portable SSD is 2x better than its previous generation hence is an automatic go-to. The question is asked to tease the Muslims. Every religion have their own weak points. Einstein has once said, nothing is absolute. Nothing is foolproof only a fool is foolproof. So let us not point out the frailty among the other credos. Also Muslims should not jump to answer lest their anxiety to negate or cover up the things would reveal what is intended to reveal here. There are websites where you can get ad verbatim response to this question. Below are the excerpts from www.corpus.quran.com. 33. 50. O Prophet, indeed we have made lawful to you your wives to whom you have given their due comp. I will attempt to answer this often misinterpreted expression, Ma Malakat Amanukam, which translates to, that which your right hand possesses, in the light of Quran and Sunnah, inshallah. The meaning and purpose behind this ruling is often not understood both by Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Some non-Muslim apologists take it to the extreme by inferring it to mean, sex slaves which comes nowhere close to what al SWT has described in the Quran. Before proceeding further I would suggest reading Kartik Vasudevan's answer first and then come back here for a better understanding of the topic. As this answer is an effort to better explain and expand on some of the points mentioned in that answer. Here is the link to that answer. Welcome back. Now, here is a bit detailed explanation on this topic. The term, Ma Malakat Amanukam, refers to female captives of war. These women are those who themselves participated in war and fought on the battlefield physically and or provided logistic and material support against the Muslims. Earlier, when the Muslims became victorious in jihad, they did not always take the defeated enemy as captives, there were times when they were set free. Or they were held to be exchanged in return for release of Muslim prisoners held captive by enemy. And lastly, it was only sometimes that they kept the captives as slaves. This decision on whether to retain or free the captives rests with the caliph and he does so keeping in mind the safety and security of the people under his caliphate and the prevalent circumstances which a caliph knows best. 
It is highly possible that if all captives are set free then they could regroup and wage a war again, the caliph of the time is better able to assess and make a judgment on how best to deal with the captives. If the caliph decides to retain the captured enemy as captives, then it is the caliph's responsibility to ensure the captives don't spend their time in cage-like jails and under detention suffering abuse physical, mental and sexual. In Islam a more humane method is adopted for these prisoners of war where the caliph himself assigns each one to a Muslim who will be their sole guardian and responsible for taking care of them going forward. Once the caliph assigns a captive to a person, the assigned person becomes their sole guardian. The new guardian has the option to either retain them under their guardianship or set them free. The captives can always ask their guardians to set them free. And if the guardian promises and signs a contract of manumission, then the guardian is obliged to fulfill it. A guardian can marry a female captive off to someone else and it is not always compulsory for him to keep her under his guardianship. If the guardian intends to marry her off, then he should not get intimate with her. The captives live and eat with their guardians in their houses. The guardian has to ensure they are not treated badly, and everything from their food to clothing and all other necessities are taken care of. The captives eat the same food and wear the same clothes like their guardians. If the guardian and his household eats fine food and wears fine clothes, equally fine food and clothes need to arrange for the captive. It is prohibited for the guardian to call the captives as, my slave, rather they are to be addressed affectionately as, my boy. Or, my girl. It is prohibited to treat them harshly, verbally abuse them or beat them. A guardian has to set the captive free if they beat or even slap them. Setting them free is an expiation for the sin of beating, slapping them. A guardian is commanded to help them if he sees they are struggling with something. It is prohibited to overburden them with any work or to ask something which is beyond their capacity. Any household work is divided equally. A captive lives like just another member of a family, eating, talking, learning, helping and living just like all the other members of the household. It's natural for a man to get inclined towards a woman captive under his custody and vice versa. He could either marry her or he could still be intimate with her as there is no sin if one gets intimate with the female captives. As discussed above, the man is completely responsible for the captive's welfare, food, clothing, shelter etc. It's very likely that such love and affection shown by the man will be appreciated and reciprocated by the female captive under his custody. It is not possible for a guardian to force himself upon her because of the points we have discussed here regarding fair treatment of captives. If a man gets intimate with his female captive, then it is compulsory for him to announce and let everyone know and not keep it a secret. Just like how a marriage is announced. It is not permitted to allow any other man to get close or intimate with a female captive under one's guardianship. The guardian is responsible and accountable for her safety and security. A man is forbidden from getting intimate with a female captive other than the one who is directly under his guardianship. He cannot get intimate with a captive woman under the guardianship of his wife or any other member of his family. This is the proof that the captives are to be treated fairly and they are not considered and utilized as, sex slaves, who can be transferred from one person to another at will for purpose of sex or any other reason. If a man intends to get intimate with his female captive, then he has to wait for a certain period of time to ensure she is not pregnant. He is forbidden to get intimate with her until that time. If the female captive is pregnant, then the man cannot get intimate with her until after she has delivered. He still has to take care of her food, clothing, shelter and other essential expenses. The guardian will also be responsible for the child after birth even though he is not the father. From theological perspective there is a double reward for a man who sets a captive under his guardianship free and marries her thereafter. Therefore Islam encourages marriage with them. Lastly, there are various virtues and rewards in Islam for setting a captive free. The Prophet Sass has said, feed the hungry, visit the sick and set the captives free, Sahih Bukhari 5058. I hope the points explained above will help understand how female captives of war should be treated and their rights in Islam. They are at par with the status of a wife in Islam and in no way are they considered and treated as, sex slaves. If anyone goes beyond these and commit excesses, like beating, raping, torturing, abusing etc., then such person will be held accountable and may be prosecuted under an Islamic law. Did Prophet sext with his aunt? The simplest way to disprove this allegation is to go to Islamic jurisprudence. As the charge is that of necrophilia, sex with a dead body, we can look into Islamic theology. If the allegation is true then the act of necrophilia would be allowed in Islam. So what does the expert Ibn Hajar Haydamit say? Well, 
He includes necrophilia in his list of sins 1. Thus we can realize necrophilia is not allowed in Islam and the Prophet did not engage in such a deed. In fact if we consult fiqh we realize, it is unlawful to look at the nakedness of the deceased or touch it, too. Thus further showing sex with the deceased dead cannot possibly be allowed. This further shows the Prophet did not engage in such a deed as if he did then the practice of necrophilia would have been allowed in Islam. Now we know that claims of necrophilia against Prophet Muhammad is lie. We will now see the claim created by Zakaria Bothros and the narration and hadith he used to make this false claim. This will also show people the filthy and dirty mind of Christians' leaders. Claim by Zakaria Bothros. Image. This is from a book called, Kanz al Yumal, The Treasure of the Workers, in the chapter of, The Issues of Women, authored by Ali ibn Husam al Din, commonly known as al Mutaki al Hindi. He based his book on the hadiths and sayings listed in, al Jami al Sagir, written by Jalal ul Din al Suyuti. Narrated by Ibn Abbas. I, Muhammad put on her my shirt that she may wear the clothes of heaven, and I slept with her in her coffin, grave that I may lessen the pressure of the grave. She was the best of Allah's creatures to me after Abu Talib, the Prophet was referring to Fatima, the mother of Ali. The Arabic word used here for slept is, idtajit, and literally means, lay down, with her. It is often used to mean, lay down to have sex. Muhammad is understood as saying that because he slept with her she has become like a wife to him so she will be considered like a, mother of the believers. This will supposedly prevent her from being tormented in the grave, since Muslims believe that as people wait for the judgment day they will be tormented in the grave. Reduce the pressure, here means that the torment won't be as much because she is now a, mother of the believers, after Muhammad slept with her and, consummated, the union. Quote, analyzing the allegation, authentic. The narration, narrated by Ibn Abbas, I, Muhammad put on her my shirt that she may wear the clothes of heaven, and I slept with her in her coffin, grave that I may lessen the pressure of the grave. She was the best of Allah's creatures to me after Abu Talib, the Prophet was referring to Fatima, the mother of Ali. Looking at the narration alone one would not cry, necrophilia, or any wrongdoing as, sex, is not mentioned. However, simply looking at the narration's English translation one would find it odd. Sleeping with somebody in a coffin grave is an odd occurrence indeed. However, once the context is given we realize what actually happened. The context and explanation. Firstly the translation of, I slept, does not best convey the meaning based in the context, the Arabic word translated as, I slept, is idtasia. This word can either mean, lie down, lie, recline, repose 3. You can check by yourself, click below to see meaning in Google translation. Show meaning. I hope you have noticed within the list of definitions lie down, lie, recline, repose the word, sleep, or sex, does not appear. So, you can see yourself how Zachariah lied about this meaning. So what context says? Did Muhammad sleep or lie in the grave? The context explains it all, as it was a grave we realize the word cannot possibly mean, sleep, but rather it means, lie, lay in the grave. This actually makes sense with the other bits of context we have at our disposal, when the grave was prepared Muhammad himself examined it and placed her into the grave, 5. Thus, it is reasonable to think the examination procedure also involved Muhammad lying in the grave. This would not have been at length in terms of duration, time. Therefore we realize Muhammad simply laid in the grave to make sure it was comfortable for his deceased foster mother as well as to honor the lady as it would be seen as a fabulous honor to be resting in a place where a prophet of God had previously laid. Did Muhammad lie with his foster mother Fatima bint Asad in the grave? It does not appear so as the process of investigating, examining the grave would have been prior, before, lowering Fatima bint Asad into the grave. Therefore Muhammad would have reclined, lied, in the grave in order to check the grave before Fatima was placed in the grave, thus he would not have lied with her. Furthermore, there were two types of graves in vogue at the time of the Prophet which were Lod and Shak, Sheik. The Shak type of grave is characterized by a niche within the grave for the dead body to be placed within. So it is impossible to lie with the body due to the niche. 8. The Lod form of grave is characterized by a lateral hollow which is dug into the side of the base of the grave for the body to be placed. 8. This type of grave makes lying with the deceased body risky as the earth could cave in on top of the body and the one who is lying with the deceased. Thus, it seems the laying in the grave for examination purposes was done prior to Fatima being lowered into her resting place. This is despite the Arabic phraseology used literally denoting, with.
However, even if one takes it literally it does not mean wrongdoing took place and it certainly does not refer to sex. If Muhammad did lie with his foster mother whilst she was in the grave in order to check for comfort and honor her before the companions filled the grave it would only have been for a short time and this would have been witnessed by other people too. There is nothing wrong with lying in the grave to ensure comfort for your foster mother and honor, in fact it was an act of great compassion. Checking Zakaria statements. Arabic Scholar. The Arabic scholar Demetrius explains, the Arabic word used here for, slept, is, idtajit, and literally means, lay down, with her. It is often used to mean, lay down to have sex. Muhammad is understood as saying that because he slept with her she has become like a wife to him so she will be considered like a, mother of the believers. Who is, Demetrius? Zakaria gives no introduction to this scholar. Why, have sex with her in order to give her a special status? Zakaria states, Muhammad is understood as saying that because he slept with her she has become like a wife to him so she will be considered like a, mother of the believers. Zakaria's premise is that Muhammad had sex with Fatima because he wanted her to attain special status as the, mother of the believers. Well, Zakaria's premise falls flat on its face because Fatima bint Asad already had the special status of being Muhammad's foster mother. In the transcript this information has been withheld, i.e. nobody is told of her special status as the foster mother of Muhammad. Why is this information not relayed to us in the transcript which is circulating the internet? It is because Zakaria's premise is thrown into doubt immediately if we are told she already has a special status. Thus if she already had a special status then there would be no need for her to be given the special status of being, like a wife to him, as she was already like a mother to him, Muhammad. So Father Zakaria's hypocrisy is fully visible. She has become like a wife to him. Father Zakaria is trying to fool Christians and others. He is claiming Muhammad had sex with Fatima in order for her to have a status of a wife of Muhammad and thus the title of, mother of the believers. Zakaria is a dishonest Christian preacher. Muhammad could not possibly have taken Fatima bint Asad as a wife as Islamic law dictates consent be given by both parties in a marriage, of course marrying a dead person would not be allowed simply based on this injunction. Father Zakaria knows this but continues with his fanciful claim because it suits his agenda to besmirch the reputation of the Prophet Muhammad. So the point here is that Fatima could never have become his wife through such an act, despite Father Zakaria's nonsensical pleadings. Thus Father Zakaria is looking even more foolish in his claim. Muhammad did this to save her from the torment of the grave. Father Zakaria is showing signs of a fertile imagination and utter ignorance. If we consult Ahadith literature we will realize Muhammad's prayer made the grave a better abode for people, Hadith, through the grace of God. This shows as if Muhammad seriously felt Fatima bint Asad was in danger of the punishment of the grave he would have simply prayed for her grave to be a better dwelling. Thus we realize Zakaria's debauched idea that sex, or marriage, is required to save a person from the punishment of the grave is warped and fallacious to say the least. Muslims